Okay, section five. Prior to the first election of the tribal council, the membership of each district shall be determined by the superintendent and a committee consisting of one delegate from each district herein designated. Therefore, the membership of the various districts shall be determined by the districts subject to review by the tribal council. So basically, this is pertaining to the first election. Does it really need to be in our Constitution? Okay. Would you say, Berta, so they could hear you? It should be in the election code. So you look at a lot of these, they're really laws and shouldn't be a part of the Constitution. That <clears throat> the membership of various districts shall be determined by the districts subject to review by the Tribal Enrollment Committee, not Tribal Council. Tina, yeah. when they're saying prior to the first election, mm -hmm. first election when, like of all time, or is when there we, something? When we first started this constitution. So that was going back to 1935, 36. So that's um, kind of a statement that isn't necessary there any, more, any longer, huh? Correct. Okay. Moving on, section six. Section six. The officer of the tribal council shall be a president and a vice president elected by the members of the Oglala Sioux tribe at large, and a secretary, a treasurer, and such other officers as may be deemed necessary, elected by the tribal council from within or outside of its own number. Officers selected from outside the membership of the council shall have no vote in the council except that the president shall vote in case of a tie. Okay. <clears throat> so this goes back to the conversation about the executive board. This is pertaining to the executive board. And what it says is that the executive board, aside from the president <clears throat> being a, and vice president being elected at large, the remaining executive board is selected by council. Therefore, the treasurer, the secretary, and the fifth member. So we had discussion about this, and what is the executive board's, you know, should they be elected all at large? Should it be a minimum in regards to the executive? Because right now, the way it is put is that council shall select these other remaining executive board members. And this is talking to several people is that we don't have an executive board, that we have a business council. And that business council does not have to be elected at large, but appointed by, if there's going to be a nine member council or whatever. So, and that they have a, a, a level of education that would, they would meet that criteria for that business council. At one time, the tribe wanted to elect the chief of police on the tribal election. Should that be put in there? Okay. Oh, Garfield. 
Um, all of the executive board members should be elected at large because the ones that the council chooses, you know, it, it's not fair. People don't get a fair chance at it because they already have their people fixed out that go in there. And you see this year after, oh, election after election after election, the same ones that go in. There's no fairness in that. So I think they should all be elected at large. Section 7, the first election of the Tribal Council here under shall be called and supervised by the Secretary of the Interior are such persons, persons as he may appoint. <coughs> so do we need that still <coughs> within our Constitution? Okay, so to strike it. Okay. Section 8. In section 8, members of the Tribal Council shall be elected for a term of two years. <laughs> I think they should be elected for a four-year term, staggered, so that you still have election every two years. Again, after talking with several people, they they thought a four-year term, because then they're not in two years. They're not able to finish some of the goals and objectives that they started with, to be able to implement those. I also think there should be a term limit, a two-year term limit. Terms. <laughs> so is that consecutively or t a total? Okay. Consecutively. Any other, Any other comments, suggestions? Criteria? There was discussion in our beginning about adding criteria to, oh, in the beginning there was discussion about adding criteria, and this is where you would add that criteria. Other than a term limit, what other criteria do you want, you know, your representatives and the executive board to have? <clears throat> But this is where this is this has to come from the people, not us. Many of us employees, mm -hmm. we have to be qualified for our job. We believe that if those governing us should also be qualified to govern us. So whatever those quali minimum qualifications are or should be, should be here, maybe they should all have a bachelor's degree in some field. That's what I think. So there was discussion from previous, me there's discussion in previous meetings where they set like a minimum when they talk about education qualifications, like a minimum of an AA, you know? And so there, there was discussion regarding that as far as education, but <clears throat> they also talked about you know, that they should speak Lakota and, you know, or have an understanding of Lakota. That was other discussions, too. So these were some of the recommendations that we were hearing. <clears throat> so section nine. nine. Elections to the Tribal Council after the first election shall be called by the Tribal Council at least 60 days prior to the expiration of office of its members.
Yep. <clears throat> so the election to tribal council after the first election shall be called so at least 60 days prior to the expiration. So we only have 60 days. So you want to run for council. You have 60 days to take out your petition, do all the paperwork, um, do your petition, your because you have to go get signatures, and then you also have to do your drug tests, your background checks. That's a part of the election code that we as candidates have to abide by, but that doesn't really give people time to know who you are and your background because you have 60 days. And some people will go 30 days prior to election and then taking out their petition to run for council or executive board. So, you know, a lot of recommendations that we heard is that it should be a lot longer. We should require them to do a year in advance so they learn what, you know, what type of person they are if selected to be a leader. So that was, that was some of the conversation around that. Okay, section 10. The Oglala Sioux Tribal Council shall be the sole judge of the constitutional qualifications of its own members. <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> I don't think the Tribal Council should ever be the sole judge of anything, <laughs> in my opinion. But in this particular instance, the qualifications should be set by the tribal membership. They should be the ones to say, hey, you want to be run for a council? You need to have a degree in some field to prove that you're knowledgeable in there. Not only that, but they should also like come from the ranks, like district representative, or I mean a district uh, officer, or even an ex-councilman. For, uh, for like the presidency or something like that, but I think they should show they have some kind of experience to govern us as a, as a council. Section 10, I was thinking, was that supposed to be talking about setting forth the election ordinance? They approved the election ordinance I'm sorry, what? The I was thinking Section about 10, you know, they're preparing for the next election. That's what we're leading up to on this. Mm -hmm. Is Section 10 should be interpreting that they shall approve the election ordinance for the next election. Right. In instead of being sole judge of whatever. Right. And, and that's what it needs to be listed as because since that time we developed an election code and in that election code that needs to be updated as well but it becomes the responsibility of one of the standing committees it falls under law and order and under law and order they that might not be their priority to update that election code so in the meantime that election code the way it stands leaves a lot of questions in the districts because then the districts have questions when they're running their elections because the districts may run their elections at a different time frame where they may go in April and March whereas tribal council runs their primary and general in the fall every two years so it happens in November right so with that being said our election code is focused towards our, our tribal council and executive branch, but it, it doesn't leave room for the districts. So at this point, the election code, all of our districts were to fall in line with the um, tribal election, but they don't. And then that's where you get all of this chaos and all these questions. And the election office charges the districts to have the elections in their districts. And so therefore, a lot of the districts still owe the election office money 
So these are a lot of conversations being had with H or law and order regarding the election code. So truly, should it be council's responsibility to be looking at the election code? Because there's no consistency or continuity there. So something to think about in regards to where does that belong? So that brings us up to Article 4, Powers of the Council. Section 1, <clears throat> Enumerated Powers. The Ogallala Sioux Tribal Council shall exercise the following powers, subject to any limitations imposed by the statutes, by the statutes or Constitution of the United States, and subject further to all express restrictions upon such powers contained in this Constitution and the attached bylaws. A, to negotiate with the federal, state, and local governments on behalf of the tribe and to advise and consult with the representatives of the Interior Department on all activities of the de department that may affect the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. B, <coughs> B to employ legal counsel for the protection and advancement of the rights of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and its members. C, to approve or veto any sale, disposition, lease, or encumbrance of tribal lands, interest in lands, and other tribal assets which may be authorized by or are execu ex executed by the Secretary of the Interior or the Commissioner of Indian Affairs or any other authorized official or agency of government provided that no tribal lands shall ever be leased for a period exceeding five years sold or encumbered except for governmental purposes. So, there, I mean, is there any discussion regarding A, B, or C as far as revisions? On uh, <clears throat> number C, it says uh, no tribal land shall ever be leased for a period exceeding five years. And uh, uh, that should be changed because uh, there are people actually that are getting uh, residential leases for a longer period that, that can show that they're, they have to because of their um, financial obligations or they're getting these loans and they have to have that lease longer than that. So it needs to be changed at five years. Um, maybe it could just be, well, I don't know how to write it here. But anyway, it needs to be re rewritten. Um, and I'm not sure I'll find out how to rewrite it, but. Um. Okay. So I, I hear what you're saying. Land Committee, we're dealing with this on a regular basis, and that is because a lot of people have sold their, their fractionated interests, um, allotted sections to the tribe. So now they want to do a, a home site lease and say they want to build a house on that home site lease that is tribal land, and the tribe cannot guarantee the mortgage agency a 25 or 30 year lease. We can only guarantee a five year lease. So creatively what we've done to help assist our membership in going after you know, building their home on this lease land is that we say they can have a lease up to 25 years but will renew every five years. So that's what we did to help work with the lending agencies. But the reality is, is a lot of our people, and that's what I talked about, the land buyback. A lot of our people are, have sold their land. And now they need land and to build a house. And with that, we can only give five-year leases. So that's because it's stipulated here in the Constitution. So we can change the language, as you said, to say that we can, typically the IRA, the boilerplate, it was 25 years. Boilerplate is you can lease 
up to 25 years with a renewal of or an update of every five years. It may be uh, useful, useful to change it not just for the, uh, the uh, residential leases but other forms of leases as well such as your, your pasture leases or your uh, range units or your farm leases. Uh, they have recreational leases also. There's, there's a lot of different types of leases that actually that exist that we don't have and so the language needs to be kind of changed to where um, we can do things a little differently uh, than we have in the past. And it's been, I, I know I attended land committee meetings for seven years as a coordinator, land natural resource coordinator, and this uh, came up <laughs> on occasion quite frequently because it does say this in the Constitution. And so the, the, the elected officials are hesitant to go against the Constitution, and I, and I don't blame them, so it needs to be changed, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> the girls are up there in front coming radical, but I'm not. I'm <laughs> One of the things that we talk about land and and uh, going back to uh, prior to the 1934 Act, uh, the federal government realized that uh, due to the fact that the uh, uh, tribes everywhere were losing their land base very fast. So in order to stop uh, losing our land base uh, across the nation, each uh, tribe, uh, they developed the IRA in the policies of the IRA I, I, uh, was to, uh, I think if you read it under Section C, was to limit selling land to, uh, uh, especially coming from the tribe. A lot of our individuals have sold lands to uh, non-Indians. And it continued to, uh, uh, over the years, uh, we lost approximately 80 million acres from 1934 to, uh, to, uh, to date. And through land buyback, I think we uh, achieved to be, get more because some of this land would have been sold to non-Indians or different areas outside, uh, uh, to individuals outside uh, uh, our reservation boundaries. And so it, uh, IRA mainly was to, uh, was set to, uh, uh, you know, the government to uh, stop the encroachment or the selling of all our uh, land to, uh, and hopefully that we could uh, become civilized. And um, standing in front of a wild Ogala, and he's uh, 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 very radical at this point in time. Uh, can't sell our land, he says, but you know. Uh, Hopefully in, the, uh, hopefully in the future that uh, we become more stabilized and, and um, utilize our uh, tribal land and uh, our uh, own uh, land for uh, economic development purposes, which is, uh, there's two different, two, two areas to save the land and to develop, and that was the main purpose of the IRA. <coughs> So if no other comments, we'll go on to Section D. Can we include treaty ter territories on A and also other federal agencies besides limiting it to the Department of Interior? Good suggestion. Okay, D, to advise the Secretary of the Interior with regard to all appropriation estimates 
our federal projects for the benefit of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation prior to the submission of such estimates to the Bureau of the Budget and Congress. Uh, so, so what this is talking about is typically with those 638 funds, remember what I talked about, that's where this budget comes into play. Is that done? Well, according to our own tribal financial management policy and procedures, what happens is the president is supposed to develop a budget in conjunction with the treasurer, that gets moved forward by November, and then it's supposed to come to council prior to the new year. So we prove the upcoming fiscal year's budget. Now with the 638 monies, as you know, those are two years planned out, two years in advance. What we're also finding with that is the fact that a lot of the unmet need isn't being accounted for because of the lack of data, okay? And you have to also understand their budget formulations have never changed, so they remain stagnant. So in regards to that, because there's a breakdown in communications, that process is not being followed today. So we have a process that limits us as well, and, and that's what's stipulated here, because it doesn't enforce what policies we have. I, I think that it should be left in there, because it gives us a mechanism to influence the BIE budget at the local level. Because there are programs that are not 638 that benefit our tribe and affect our tribal constituencies. So we, we should be able to look at whatever budget they have and put our say-so in there. So like advise them that our, we need more money in general assistance. We need you to manipulate your budget to put more in general assistance. I mean, we have that power, right? Or uh, at least to at least to put that say so in there, because I know that the superintendent comes and they get all over him over general assistance, so he takes money from somewhere else and puts it in there or whatever. I don't know how he does it, but the people get their general assistance anyway. But there are other other areas such as forestry that we don't have 638 on, firefighting we don't have 638 on, and things like that. And I know that for a fact that if you don't use, if the BIA at a local level don't use money up, they give it back. Mm -hmm. And it should never work that way. Yep. Yep. So, go ahead. On a, the 638 programs, it seems to me from the past, uh, I think, I ran the first 638 program ever within the tribe, and that was 1978. The superintendent had very little to do with that, except authorization. So where the negotiations took place was between the tribe and the area office for unmet needs. So if you could provide that information that there was, say, $50,000 unmet needs, then you could negotiate that with them. So I don't know if they still do that. No? Uh, no, no. So, so because you have to understand, um, through time, the BIA has reorganized themselves and processes, and they added different offices as well, like the Office of Self-Determination. And where does the majority of the funding go from self-determination? Basically, goes back into administration. So when we look at those, those negotiation processes, it, it really isn't happening there. So when we talked about GA, for example, you know, uh, when the acting superintendent was reporting to us, 
regarding the lack of funds because they are only covering, what was it, 80% of the budget, only 80%. That's all they have the funds for. So we know we're going to run out and, we'll, and the people will go without for three months until the next fiscal year. Now, as I said, those formulas have not changed even though they restructured. So there's no way we can increase that to cover 100% because, like I said, the formula didn't change. Our population needs have changed, but their formula didn't change. Now there's another program that we are trying to work with council to get that increase and, and, and it's a, a really, I think, a, a good opportunity for tribal nations to move forward on. However, we have a lot of hesitation by council uh, in regards to how we can truly have consultation in regards to our budget needs. So that's where we're at. Okay. Section, <clears throat> section E, to make assignments of tribal land to members of the Oglala Sioux Tribe in conformity with Article 10 of this Constitution. Mm, we'll go on to F. To manage all economic affairs and enterprises of the Oglala Sioux Tribe in accordance with the terms of a charter that may be issued to the tribe by the Secretary of the Interior. G, to appropriate for public purposes of the tribe any available tribal council funds. H, to levy taxes or licenses, or <coughs> excuse me, to levy taxes or license fees upon persons on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and to require the performance of community labor in lieu thereof. <laughs> on section H it, to levy taxes fees upon persons should we include businesses contract permanent and temporary and other services that's existing like we have um, high lines going through the reservation but they're not connected to anything they're just high lines are, are we taxing those um, kind of services, pipelines in and around the reservation on territories of the tribe? It's good to add them. Oh, you're right. We need to include that in there, the commerce, you know, businesses, as you said. However, is that being done? No. So typically, in the state, if you look at state municipalities, they develop a utilities commission. The utilities commission works with all of the entities and makes sure there's a good plan in place. So that includes when these companies come in, for example, Golden West. They're laying down upgrades with their fiber optics, okay? So when they present it to council at this last meeting, I asked, are you removing the old wire? They said, no. I said, is this just an upgrade with the existing right-of-ways? They said, yes. Now, have we been charging for our right-of-ways? No. That's where it falls into. So until we get a strong utilities commission in place, these businesses will not be taxed because there's nothing there developed as far as a code to enforce that. And who would they go through to develop that? So for example, when we have natural disasters and we had um, temporary communities pop up because of natural disasters and they had to lay down infrastructure for these temporary communities, the trailer houses. Remember that? All those FEMA trailer houses? When they did that, who kept track of where all the piping went? 
who kept track of all the new electrical lines that went in. Who has the, ground, the blueprints of all of that? So when something breaks down, they don't know where to go to fix it because they don't have the blueprints in place. Now, did these companies get charged for putting in this additional lines and so forth? So who has the monopoly on it? The utilities companies, if you think about it. So when we talk about this, taxes, we also forget that in our treaties, we are not to tax our people. And yet we make a, an agreement with the state saying, oh, we can't tax non-members, but we're sure going to tax our members. So we have that compact in place at the state level. So when we talk about taxes, we need to keep all of that in mind in regards to not only businesses, but our population. I, to remove trespassers and exclude and banish persons from within the boundaries of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation as defined in Article 1. Good. <laughs> I was going to say something. No. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, from my experience, and as, as young as I am, I've been watching the council, um, and not, not to uh, demonize them, but knowing that uh, I've known one example in Wounded Knee District that uh, this leaser had more more authority than uh, the uh, previous owner of that land and there was a dispute that landed up in court and i think our uh our uh resident former resident of that co uh, district uh, lost the case because of the deed. And another example that relates to the previous, um, the previous issue that you, you mentioned about the deeded lands. We have a lot of, in the old traditional way, in the were before all these deeded, uh, when there was these uh, new laws came into being that there was a, a chunku in the traditional way anybody could cross anybody's land and that was the right respectful courtesy of living cooperatively and neighborly in a good way. That is not happening today. Because I know on my own land, there's a deeded land next to mine, and I can't cross that land. But we had been using that uh, road for generations, and all of a sudden, this new lease comes in and has more authority than us. And we're the tribal members. We should have the right to make rules and in favor of our land. That's what I wanted to put. On this particular section of whatever it is, the removal of trespassers and banishing people from the tribe within the pine tribal boundaries. 
you know what? That's very, relatively tame compared to a traditional system of justice. Because when a person committed a crime or anything similar to a crime against a member of its own tribe was also banished. Their name was, was stricken from anybody's memory. They were never supposed to speak to them or talk to them or talk about them ever again. And that was really hard on families, but that kept everybody in line. And uh, so this, this piece right here is relatively tame. Because you could banish them from the res, they go live over there in white clay. You could go over and visit them and talk to them, whatever. Or if there's a trespass, you just remove them off of that piece of trespass, and it's done deal. So this is really tame compared to a, a traditional form of doing it. And uh, I, I, for one, believe that this or something very similar to this should stay in here. I think Milton. Milton. Oh, Milton, then I'll come back. Yeah. Um, I guess for me it's like, uh, why not? You know, keep it in there. Because um, with the current situations that we have going on here on the reservation, I think if I remember right, in certain codes of the tribe, there is banishment now regarding certain drugs. Mm -hmm. So I mean, um, not only it's, you know, it's uh, being enforced on our own members, but we need to also enforce it on those right. that are coming from the outside of this right. reservation, come here harming our people. Right. So I really think that really needs to stay in place and we need to enforce that. Thanks. So what we need to add in there is not only our tribal members, but non-members and claim that jurisdiction because it's within our boundaries. That's, that's encouraged by the district attorney, the United States district attorney to take, a, take assertive action over non-members because we do have jurisdiction and it will hold up in federal court. One of the things is under the bad man clause in the treaty, I had a daughter-in-law that was ran over and killed, her and her companion. Now this is a, a classic art case. It's in a library in Albuquerque under uh, case, case histories where you could re reference back to them. But that was upheld, was upheld in federal court and it was not against a non-member but it was against the United States government. Mm -hmm. And my grandkids, they won that case. So one of the things when you're looking at this because I always think that this should be removed and it should go through our courts. And the reason I'm saying is that is because of due process, you know, that everybody is entitled to that. So is it the consul that can determine that or should it be the, the courts to determine that? because there's almost two sides to everything. So that's what I wanted to bring up. And that's an awesome point you just made. Is it going through the judicial system or the political system? And sometimes our community members choose to go through the political system versus the judicial system. This is in a classic example of what happened in Wombly. And they asked tribal council to remove an individual, a non-member, off the reservation. Now, where does it stipulate that tribal council when it comes to us? It's when the president or the vice president deems that it needs to come to tribal council. So there is a process, that due process, to a certain extent. However, this is in there was to protect our people to a certain extent to kind of enforce what was in the treaties with the bad man clause. However, it's been more utilized for our own membership versus non-membership because it doesn't list that. It's like we're, we're too afraid to exert our authority on non-members. 
Because the community wanted to go through the political process and not the judicial process, there's nothing in place. So then I made a motion to have law and order assign an attorney to work on the political due process for banishing somebody from our reservation, non-member and member. Because we do get that request. They do not want to go through the political process, I mean the judicial process, they want to go through the political process. And because it happened before, where they did blackball people off the reservation. So uh, that's where it comes from. And we really need to, I think, as, as a people, really look at that and update it to say, what does that political due process look like? for member and non-member. Oh. Am I understanding that you're, you're saying that it should be more defined, specifically defined? And um, I, I guess personally, I think that, the, that it should remain in there, but be more specifically declined, you know, because there are instances when uh, it, that authority might have to be exercised, you know, for the best interest of the community as a whole. Milton. I think regarding this particular issue, there was there is really a case. I mean, that might want to be looked at with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe recently, where the tribe had uh, directed a banishment you know, of a member, and that then that person took it to the judicial system, where the Supreme Court there upheld the tribe's decision. So that might be something they can look into. Um, I could add, uh, Cheyenne River has a banishment clause in uh, Rosebud, and uh, I know we have one, but it hasn't really been exercised or defined um, per se. I know at the Tribal Chairman's Health Board meeting, the, some of the tribes have expressed concern about this certain issue, and so what they had suggested was that they ask a lawyer to research and bring some information back to the Tribal Chairman's Health Board Association because um, they wanted to network with each tribe. Um, like say if somebody from Cheyenne River got banished, um, if they have relatives here, then the, the judicial system would contact ours, our system here and let them know that so-and-so was banished and, and send the paperwork here so that we when they came here, then we would have the authority to exercise or not, whether we want this individual in our territory or not. So they wanted to network somehow like that because the, the meth was getting so prevalent on all of our reservations. So. Because there's a distinction between tribal land and allotted land, how does that affect this? I mean, if there's a banishment of a tribal member and they own land here, and it's to them, I mean, you can't like legally kick them off their own land, right? Normally, I, how I see that is the government usually goes with what the tribe wants because, because of the Major, Crime Act, Major, Major Crimes Act, it's concurrent jurisdictions between the tribe and the government um, with regard to that. So. Um, moving on, J, to enact resolutions or ordinances not inconsistent with Article 2 of this Constitution concerning membership of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Okay. Article, oh. two is membership. Ar Article 2 is membership, so they're saying they can't go against anything in Article 2 regarding membership. Okay. Okay. To promulgate and enforce in ordinances 
governing the conduct of persons on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and providing for the maintenance of law and order and the administration of justice by establishing a reservation court and defining its duties and powers. Jay? Jay so what about separation of powers? Council still defines it. According to Jay, or K. K. Like the, the alcohol, alcohol, sale of alcohol, legalizing it on a reservation. In a lot of the Constitution revisions, they just, that was it. They were voted on, the people voted for them, and nothing was done. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, Al, to purchase under condemnation proceedings in courts of contempt jurisdiction or competent jurisdiction, land or other property needed for public purposes. I would, I would uh, suggest changing it to acquire under condemnation, condemnation proceedings and to me, this, this could have been used in the fee patent land in Indonesia, um, and it was discussed by the land committee, you know, uh, several times. Um, back, in, back in the 70s, uh, uh, I drafted a resolution for Eagle Nest District uh, to condemn all fee patent land within the boundaries, the original boundaries of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, and uh, it was passed by consensus by about 100 people. And I explained to the people that, you know, this wasn't probably going to be approved by the tribal council. But um, I had read in the Constitution where the, the, the tribe had that, uh, that power to do that. And um, I, also in the resolution, I said if tribal members owned fee patent land, they'd have time to put it back into trust, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, but anyway, that's when I was young, <laughs> young and uh, I uh, had big dreams, I guess. But the, uh, it's an important one, you know, and it's never been used. It's never been used by the Ogallal Sioux Tribe. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's good in a way. It shouldn't be used, you know, it should be used very in infrequently if it involves allotted land for sure. But it, if it's in a non-Indian, you know, fee patent land, and it's in a uh, sacred area, uh, you know, a historical site or something like that, I think there's justification to do that. Thanks. Gilbert. <clears throat> one. You know, people are really afraid of that word condemnation. It was evident when they were trying to put up the Tribal National Park. The word came up, condemnation, and all the people on top of the register table objected to it. I mean, all the landowners, I should say, it, with exception of the tribe. The tribe didn't care. But <clears throat> that word condemnation frightens everyone because it's kind of like a historical trauma thing where the federal government came and took land away. Then they came and they gave, they gave allotments out there on the Badlands National Park or wherever that is, out in the Badlands out there. And then they let them buy it back. Then here they come again and take it away. So it's kind of like a fear thing. So condemnation is a bad word in my book. Hey, M, to protect and preserve the property Wildlife and Hold natural. On. Steph, we got path. one more. Oh, sorry. Oh, I I question that too because, you know, in where the gentleman there previous to my speaking said that uh, the land over there, uh, around um, the south unit, and uh, some of the you know, the local areas where these churches prop up. 
Now, who decided that land for sale? You know, who, who gave them authority, you know? And, and what I see is these nonprofits coming on and buying the land. And I have no problem with private business if it was our people. And I don't, I'm not racist at all, but this is our land. We should have control of it. We should be the authority of it. But what I have a problem with it is that they're, they're making themselves millionaires through exploitation of our culture and using our children just during the few months in the summer where they can, you know, and I understand about freedom of religion and everything, but, you know, I have a problem where um, they're using the name of the Indian, the poor, impoverished, addicted Indian to profit. And you see them, they're our neighbors. You know who they are. So M, to protect and preserve the property, wildlife, and natural resources, gases, oils, and other materials, etc., of the tribe, and to regulate the conduct of the trade and the use and disposition of property upon the reservation. And to regulate, preserve, and strengthen native arts, crafts, culture, and the Lakota language. O, to charter subordinate organizations for economic purposes and to regulate the activities of associations thus chartered by the tribal council or any other associations of members of the tribe which are indebted to the tribe. Um, let's turn. I think M is uh, really important. After reading that declaration of the United Nations, I don't know if the tribe's going to adopt that. I know it's in draft form. But anything having to do with um, our natural resources, gas, oils, and other materials, uh, the tribe should not have that sole responsibility in determining that. That should be a consensus of the people. that uh, it could be rewritten in a in better in a better uh, way it's maybe it's all in one sentence i think and it could it could be written in like three different sentences and Okay, O, to charter subordinate, oh, I already read that, sorry, P, to regulate the inheritance of property, real and personal, other than allotted lands within the territory of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Q, to regulate the domestic relations of members of the tribe. Define it. So she asked to define Q, and that is to regulate the domestic relations of members of the tribe. Domestic relations. So we regulate basically kind of the, the social norms within the reservation. Uh, how to put that, for example, is that the tribe went ahead and defined for what for finally in 2008 the bill of rights to give you guys the bill of rights now how is that enforced in our tribal courts it's not okay 
So when we regulate the members, is that that's what it talks about, is having that due process. We define all of that through tribal council. And that's what that's stating. Does that make sense? Does that help you? Okay. Or to adopt laws re regulating the appointment of guardians for minors and mental incompetents who are members or are eligible for membership of the tribe. S, to adopt laws regulating the procedure of the Tribal Council, the Executive Committee, chartered organizations, and subcommittees of the Tribal Council, and to adopt laws establishing the order of business during regular and special meetings of the Tribal Council. R, T, to delegate to subordinate boards or officers or to cooperative associations which are open to all members of the tribe, any of the foregoing, foregoing powers, reserve the right to review any action taken by virtue of such delegated power. You, to adopt ordinances regulating the procedure of the council itself and of other elected officials of the reservation through a comprehensive code of ethics and removal procedures. V, okay. Okay, that's, that was kind of, I thought, taken care of <laughs> with your ethics board, which is non-existent today so you you could pass all the laws you want but if it's they're not recognized or in force then it doesn't mean anything so I think that really needs to change um, when you adopt an ordinance there has to be an enforcement policy on the console or there has to be consequences for them so we all have consequences when we do something that's wrong or right, there's a consequence both ways. So I think that's really important because that was what the people wanted way back when, you know? And that's what I always said, you know, you, you guys are the tribal council, but who, who governs you? Who keeps you in check, you know? So that's, was the purpose, I thought. So just to, just to um, touch on that in regards to the comments with the ethics board, when we got into council, we went at, made the motion to um, advertise for the ethics board. And the advertisement did go out. However, we did not get a lot of people who um, applied for the ethics board it was just one person and we have it's a, it's a, a board of three and so with one person we need more of our people to stand up and who governs us where's that checks and balance well it's supposed to be the people the people are who are supposed to put us in that checks and balance because we were selected by the people but yet there is you know there's no true checks and balances within our, our representation. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, ask a, or make a comment about the checks and balances and who, who does that, you know, for the council. And it's supposed to be the people. But we all know that that's backwards. That doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and when I... When I initially raised my hand, I wanted to make a uh, comment about, you know, reading this uh, item number U, to adopt ordinances regulating the procedure of the council itself and other elected officials of the reservation through a comprehensive code of ethics and removal procedures. So. 
Am I reading it correctly that council is, is uh, the one responsible to approve that ordinance? Or are they in the removal part of it as well when it comes to uh, an elected official? I think um, in, our, in our election, I mean not election, but our code of ethics, it says that it has to go back to council. Council, ha according to the constitution, council, council's the only one that can remove council. So that's, I think that's going to be up in one of the sections there. You guys have recommendations. So I would recommend that uh, if an elected official did something that somebody wants to remove them from office, that should be going back to the district, the people that elected them to begin with. You know, because they're, and so they have to go in front of their own uh, district members for that. And and if, and if a district so thought or chose to remove somebody that they elected, then I don't think that, that the council should be allowed to trump that decision because it's the people that are, have elected you and the people think that you should be removed. You know, and of course, everything is based on due process and hearing and so on and so forth. But once the district chooses to remove you, then that's how it should be. Patricia had a, uh, her hand up. Okay, along that same line, I really agree with what Penny is saying. So to have a... Uh, not only at a district meeting because we know that relatives come, we know that people, friends come and like that to attend this meeting. So have a ballot election and put what happened, the chart, well, what, 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 what happened and all that, why the removal process and then vote like that. Then the council could, how do you say it, goes to council and they accept it. They have no choice but to because of the district people's wishes. Yeah, yeah I think that whole um, ordinance, so it should be revamped and reworded somehow because we, or I've seen a lot of instances where the council has taken upon themselves to micromanage programs. And maybe this is why they think they have total authority of all of the, all the programs and, and districts and stuff. Because if you remember last administration and I've seen one instance in this administration where uh, that didn't apply to certain people. And they seem to target um, programs. You know, if, they're wanna, um, if there's weaknesses in a program, for instance, it should be evaluated and assessed and not removal, you know, don't, don't just throw them under the bus because they've made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. But I don't know how that applies to treasurers or the, even themselves, you know, because we, we know several years ago, Lowell was a vital and pretty uh, professional operating program that met the needs of the children and families and fostering care, foster care. 
but because of one individual on the council. And I can't believe just, I can't believe how that, the whole 17 or 16 council people bought into that. And it was based on lies and we couldn't even have a, a recourse to be, uh, you know, to be accused of certain things and we didn't even know what the allegations were. We didn't even have that chance. So I think this, this, uh, this ordinance uh, or this procedure, there's two parts in that. And it, I think it goes back to the previous uh, article or the section that, you know, the ethics, you know, and how do they police themselves? How do they police themselves? They don't. Another thing, uh, just there's so much there that if you look at the past and what has occurred and what's present and how we're trying to fix things as a people, so um, the people will benefit. One of the things is um, sovereign immunity, you know. When you use that to protect yourself from a wrongdoing is really wrong. And the people don't have a recourse. So I think that really needs to be looked at and amended or changed that any member of this tribe feels that they have um, a case to pursue against a, the tribe or a council person that they should be able to do that in a court of law. So you take it into court of law and it says sovereign immunity, can't hear it. So that's another thing I want to address. Thank you. The code of ethics is a behavior. And if the code of ethics of this tribe is removed or rescinded, there should be a time frame or automatic reinstatement. Because if we rescind the law that governs the behavior of people, there's certain things that are gonna happen and they're gonna be able to say, we don't have a code of ethics, I can do that. So I would say on this item U, to adopt ordinances regulating the procedure of council, not only council, other elected officials of the reservation, but there's a, other people that should be controlled under our tribal code of ethics. You know, the attitudes of others affect the lives of, of people that live here, work here, and do business here. So it, there should be a regulated time frame. If the council chooses to remove something of this importance, there should be also a time frame for them to either resend what they resended and put it back because it, if they take too long to amend anything, then they, they become out of control. So, with that being said, know that um, we did, we, this, this administration did work to try to implement the, the ethics board. And I know last administration, you guys worked on the revision of the code of ethics and put in penalties and so forth to um, strengthen that particular ordinance and in, in that it does apply to those public figures as well. So. It wasn't just limited to council. And to really make that 
effective is, is maybe it needs to be separated out and be an entity that is functioning and is, is compensated to review the complaints that come through our violation of code of ethics. So with that being said, then how does that apply to our courts? Because this is a political process, it's not a judicial process. You gotta keep that in mind. Where is the separation? And when does it go to, from the political to the judicial? So that hasn't been defined in regards to that. So we need to really think about that when we look at what does that mean? And it needs to be further developed. Would you enforce the separation of powers at this point? So does tribal council enforce the separation of powers? Okay. So if you look at judicial powers, that's where it was created is the separation of powers. And we do. However, who's still picking the chief judge? Who's still picking the prosecutors, who's still selecting the AG, who selects them? That's right. Council selects these individuals. So how is that a true separation of powers? So can you say we're really enforcing it if we're still selecting them? That's why I brought it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and, and so that's a good point, and that's why we're here, right, to change this. So when we get to the judicial powers, Article 5, as soon as we get there, we can talk about those changes. Okay, so subsection V was repealed, um, subsection W to adopt laws protecting and promoting the health and general welfare of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and its membership. Section two, future powers. The Tribal Council of the Oglala Sioux Tribe may exercise such further powers as may, as may in the fu future be delegated to the council by members of the tribe or by the Secretary of the Interior or any other duly authorized official or agency of the federal government. Section three, Reserved powers. Any rights and powers heretofore vested in the Oglala Sioux Tribe but not expressly referred to in this constitution shall not be abridged by this article but may be exercised by the people of the Oglala Sioux Tribe through the adoption of appropriate bylaw and constitutional amendments. Okay, Article 5, Judicial Powers. Section one, creation. The, the, the judicial power of the Oglala Sioux Tribe shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in other inferior tribal courts established by the tribal council. The Supreme Court and other inferior tribal courts shall be independent from the tribal council and the executive committee. And no elected official exercising powers of the tribal council are the executive committee shall exercise powers vested in the Supreme Court or other inferior tribal courts. So this is the revision that happened in 2008, the revision in 2008, in which they refer to a superior court and inferior. Now, what does the term inferior mean to you? Less. Not good, right? That's the impression you get. So do we want to call the lower courts, meaning our civil courts, inferior? Because what we give the impression to our people is sometimes when we say inferior, it also means inferior process. Yes. Um, several years ago, when Johnson Holy Rock was on the uh, board with the Supreme Court, I remember the council, uh, I don't know, the, I don't remember the issue, but this is an example. The council went and took the authority 
away from Supreme Court. And I thought that was really a bad, huge grievance against uh, uh, Supreme, uh, the Council at that time. And you know, as I said it earlier, that, you know, I've seen several generations of Council come and go. And each, each, um, Council in the two-year process is um, imperfect. We're, I'm not looking for perfection, but I think the gross mishandling of that example and some of the um, other uh, actions that the Council do, it seems like the Council, to me, it has a supreme supreme law of the land, and it isn't. It isn't. If we have to go, we go by a constitution that is supposed to be uh, by the people and for the people, but it isn't. It's not that way. And, you know, I look at the videos that uh, Tom Oh, Tony Brave puts out on KOLC, and I see some of the, uh, not all of them, but some of the uh, sessions. And I'm not pointing fingers, but I think that, you know, this process of, of uh, looking at this whole constitution and the judicial powers and uh, the separation of, uh, you know, we have that Trump, but look at Donald Trump today. You know, what, what he's exercising, the way he's um, going over trying to uh, emerge himself into the judicial powers. We don't have that separation of powers here. When you have tribal council in earlier discussions, what type of background do they have when the people of our courts have a, a, a level of education that permits them to work in those positions? And if council and the membership of law and order is going to govern our law of this tribe, then their background as law and order committees members of council should have the same type of education to take on these kind of challenges. I think we should seriously take a good look at that. Level of education required to make judgments and calls against uh, our court system, which require that to be able to work there to begin with. I think, I think we could probably cover everything if we change superior court and inferior courts just to say tribal courts. Just to delete those two things. Because then it will read uh, the tribal vested in the courts established by a tribal council. And these courts shall be independent from the tribal council, executive committee, or, and the executive committee and no elected official exercising powers of the tribal council or executive committee shall exercise powers vested in those courts. Okay, section two, jurisdiction. 
The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the Oglala Sioux Tribe Constitution, the laws of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, and to all persons and property within the jurisdiction of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Section 3, Powers of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court shall exercise the following powers. A, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction over any case on appeal from inferior tribal courts. B, the Supreme Court shall have the power to declare laws of the Oglala Sioux Tribe void if such laws are not in agreement of the Oglala Sioux Tribe Constitution. All decisions of the Supreme Court shall be in writing and shall be final. C. Justices of the Supreme Court must have a Juris Doctorate from an ABA accredited law school and must be licensed to practice law in any state or federal jurisdiction. D. Justices of the Supreme Court shall be appointed to the Supreme Court by the Tribal Council and shall serve a six-year term. So D, the justice of the Supreme Court shall be appointed to the Supreme Court by the Tribal Council and shall serve a six year term. So if we want separation of powers, should Tribal Council be selecting the Supreme Court judge? Gilbert. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just looked away as I said. Um. You know, if everybody watches TV, they had this they had this issue in the United States government where uh, Obama picked a su superior court judge or a Supreme Court judge and uh, they let it they didn't act on it until the new president came in and he picked somebody else and they picked that guy right away. It didn't take very long to put him right in there. <clears throat> That's a... And then what happens then is the, the Supreme Court then becomes more on the side of the Republicans and their way of viewing things. The same thing could happen with our court, our judges, because the council could put them in, put somebody in there for six years who's going to be on the side of those council people. Mm -hmm. So indirectly, they have influence over a judge. Mm -hmm. And that should never happen. These people should be independently picked. But by whom? The people. That's the question. I feel like Vanna White. <laughs> yeah. Pretty soon Jackie's really going to be a runner. I, I, my suggestion is that it be put into a referendum. Vote and somebody mentioned about staggered terms, so always having three members um, there at all times and have staggered terms, but put it out for referendum. And then put the names on there, their, their background, whatever. And let the people vote. Yeah, I think that um, these type of positions here that what tribal council, you know, has, uh, has access to do in, in selecting and picking, I think that should be taken away because if you look at the current judicial system now, is that uh, we're very unstable from... Uh, you know, it could be from the Supreme Court all the way down. I know at the lower courts that there's some very instability there right now in, uh, the, in uh, 
I think we have to be reminded that pe the people are the, one are, the, are the ones who are hurting right now because of the instability of the judicial system. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Section 4, powers of the inferior tribal court. The inferior tribal court shall exercise the following powers. A, inferior tribal court shall have the power to make findings of fact and conclusions of law and shall have the power to issue all remedies in law and in equity, including injunctive and declaratory relief and all writs, including attachment. And that must be me memorandums? Mm -hmm. Supposed to be memorandums. <laughs> B, inferior tribal courts shall have the power to declare the laws of the Oglala Sioux tribe void if such laws are not in agreement with the Constitution. C, the chief judge of inferior tribal courts shall oversee the administration of justice of inferior tribal courts and must have a Juris Doctorate from an ABA accredited law school and must be licensed to practice law in any state or federal jurisdiction. D. The chief judge of inferior courts shall be elected at large by eligible voters of the Oglala Sioux Tribe under ordinances promulgated by the Tribal Council and shall serve a four-year term. Okay. When was the last time that we got to, the people got to elect a judge through an election process? About eight years? Well, um, as a tribal member, I don't ever remember given an opportunity to vote for a judge. And you got to remember, uh, uh, Steph and I are new to tribal council this administration, first time ever. so. In regards to that, um, we were told that, you know, we're going to select the judges as counsel. So that's why it's important when we talk about this that we do include the language in this constitution because that's what tribal council has to follow is legislation that's incorporated within the constitution. Yeah. But as far as the people ever having an opportunity, I don't remember that. Yeah, we voted, I think, was that like eight years ago? 10 years ago? And then he was removed by consul, so. And then we never did have elected, so, yeah, chief judge after that. You know, if we think that they're elected at large, right? Then who would remove them? Who would remove the judges? Say they're found. I get in trouble if I don't use the mic. <laughs> so just a question. It help, help us. Help us think about this process. So what would that look like? If they're elected at large, all the judges are elected by the people, then once they're seated, they're staggered terms, say one of the judges violates our laws, who holds them accountable? And what is the process for removal? She has a solution. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that goes to the, back to the districts so they can create an ordinance or resolution to, to remove, and that go back, goes back to council. So, it's, again, it's up to the people. I think I... You know, I worked in the courthouse for several years, um, and <clears throat> I've seen, um, I can understand why this, this section uh, under C, the chief judge, shall oversee the administration of the uh, tribal courts. It doesn't say anything in here about personnel. 
But we had several, uh, while we, I know of one judge that uh, is probably a member, but she lived in Iowa or someplace and came in with an attitude of authority and started uh, micromanaging the, the court personnel. And I know of another instance where um, in a uh, court administration uh, was already in place, but this uh, individual came in and fired eight individuals in the courthouse. And did, it, they didn't even have a um, recourse. They, I think through the, uh, through the due process, they got back their jobs. But that, those are poor examples of, um, you know, I know that this probably is, uh, I, I'm here the first, this is my first session of uh, this, given my input. But I know of several instances where uh, the council again put their fingers into the uh, judicial system. And, and that's why I said there sh should be a separation of powers uh, defined in black and white where the council doesn't overstep their boundaries. And uh, I think, you know, that this, uh, I'm very uh, glad that this is happening because for one, the people, uh, the programs, and I, I've been a program manager for several years under the tribe myself when I was working, and I know that uh, we just have, uh, we have line items, and, uh, but another thing, is, another side issue is the financial. You know, the programs have their own budgets. And uh, I know several, uh, I'm getting off the issue here, so I'm gonna end here and uh, know that, you know, in this teaching session, I think that those, uh, the executive, judicial, and uh, what's the other one? <laughs> anyway, those should be outlined and, you know, so we can, uh, yeah, put the checks and balances in there. I think if you just, if you look at it and what it says, uh, especially in that section one, that shall be independent from the tribal council and the executive committee. Now when, you, when you're looking at judicial powers and it's a part of the constitution, I think when you have a separation of powers that your judicial system has to stand alone. It has to be created just like the council was in their constitution. So does your judiciary part. So then it's a total separation of powers. The council does not have power over judicial, which the way it should be, but it's not. So looking at maybe, I don't know, do you, do you do a whole, you have your codes, you, but it's not really defined. The only thing you would do was is pass those after you, your review because you're legislators. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. We were just, when we were talking about uh, Section 4D, the Chief Judge of the lower courts shall be elected at large. And then the question came up, 
when did we ever elect a judge? Uh, and then Tina, you mentioned that um, when you two came on board, or for, you know, in your first year, you were told that you guys were going to elect um, a judge. So, in essence, no, there, there really is no clear answer for uh, when did we ever elect a judge? You, you know, people at large. So, along all those lines, when the Constitution is violated by the Council, who holds them accountable, or how is it brought up? I mean, how is it addressed? I mean, it's okay that it is violated, or does it uh, does it just happen and then um, it's just never uh, addressed? And how about an ordinance? We know we all know an ordinance is the law of the land, basically that governs everything on down after you know that's written there. When an individual violates an ordinance, who addresses that? Where is the complaint taken? To the council or to the courts? Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, that's where our ethics comes in with complaints and, and things like that. But it's not, there's no enforcement. We don't have a, a committee right now, an ethics committee. But uh, today we're here because we want to hear your suggestions. What do you guys think? If, it's, if it isn't working, what do you want changed? You know, so I, I know that we have, um, there's a lot of concerns, but we're, that's why we're here, so that you guys can address it. So that's one of the things that, it's your opportunity. So, the, so there are, the Constitution is there, ordinances are there, the ethics code is there, but what, what I don't see is the enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm going back to, okay, so who addresses counsel when the enforcement is not there? And then, Tina, you had made the comment that you guys advertised for the election code committee. I mean, ethics, ethics I'm sorry, ethics uh, committee, but you only got one person, you know, well then, for, uh, uh, speaking as a tribal member, who who trusts that they're going to be there? Because if we, you know, if we a person got in, uh, put in for that board and got selected to be on the ethics committee, and then the right decision isn't made, you're thrown out anyway. I mean, I mean, technically, that is the that is the history, and so you know, people at large, we don't trust you. Know, um, and comments, you'll you'll hear them. I'm sure you have, not just with the ethics committee, but anything else. You know, like this. Uh, why should we? Because they don't listen. They just do what they want anyway. So back to my question is, you know, there are there are the Constitution is in place. This one right here is in place. Ordinances are in place. Ethics code is in place. But who enforces that? So that's a comment, I guess. So, you know, just to touch on that, mm -hmm. when you talked about the separation of powers, whether it's judicial, legislative, and executive, okay. So who is supposed to follow through once the legislative branch creates ordinance, creates law? Who's supposed to follow up and enforce that law? The executive branch. But there is no separation with the executive branch. So if you looked at the responsibilities of that, it's fairly limited in the roles and responsibilities. The executive branch is immersed in the legislative branch. Therefore, tribal president cannot take action unless he has a resolution coming from council. Do you see? So, for example, made a motion to sue BIA. Now, where is that motion at? 
the executive branch isn't following through with that motion. Do you see? So when you talk about checks and balances, you gotta look at all three in regards to their roles and responsibilities. And when you say, well, you know, council is gonna do whatever council wants to do. I mean, that's been the practice. Why? Because what you guys talked about earlier, that sovereign immunity. If you look at what's happening in DC and all those congressmen, they're being sued, right? Why? Because they don't have sovereign immunity and the people are holding them accountable. So that goes back to those checks and balances. And I, I know we had hands up there, so, but I just wanted to address the question. Okay, mine goes back to when Penny stated about the, uh, the referendum vote on the judges. Uh, Berta knows and Pat knows, but back in the day, remember we voted for, remember Pat Lee or Diane Zephyr? as a chief judge, right? So it did happen, it, it did happen before. I just wanted to remind people. Somebody else had their hand up. I think as maybe I may be uh, out of my role, uh, the thing that uh, solution like even right now uh, what I would suggest before um, you know all, I don't know how many sessions you're gonna have in this reform or revision of the Constitution but I would suggest I don't know when your term is up uh, in a, next year yeah, that you protect this process if we, if, you know, you, if you don't establish because, you know, I foresee it, you know, the next, next council will come along and say, heck with it, you know, so I, that's what I would, I would suggest that you protect this process so that we can continue to dialogue and make these changes and make it a government by the people, the way, the traditional way. I'm not really saying no, we should go back to the traditional way, but we're in, in the 20th, 21st century now. So, so um, I would, that's what I would say in the, because, you know, right now, it, it doesn't look good the way it's in operation. Because I know at my age, again, I have seen generations of council people come and go all the time, uh, recycling. And then another thing I would suggest before the ending is a term limits term limits on the council because you have various council members that have been there for uh, eight, nine terms and you don't see any changes in their district. Okay. This ongoing, <laughs> would you have to pass the ordinance for the next council coming in that this is would be ongoing? Right. Harold Dean Soloway's administration, he called together a council of elders. The meeting took six hours. We recorded it at the Wakbamni, but the question arose from one of the elders, what gives us the authority to do this? So they were kind of questioned that, but I was sitting there recording. I said, in this setting, the Constitution government, the first word, we. So, the question, who's going to enforce 
the removal of counsel, removal of the president, removal of the chief judge, we, meaning a person who takes the oath of office has the complete authority to enforce the rules of its constitution. You don't need to have a, a line of authority or anything like the president of the United States. Eventually, we are a member of that. We in this country is going to have to remove this Trump. Same as any member of this constitutional government of the Pine Ridge Reservation. Elected members who take the oath of office has that complete authority to do it. Hey, Section 5, <clears throat> Compensation. The Tribal Council shall have the power to establish the level of compensation for justices of the Supreme Court and judges of inferior tribal courts, provided that the compensation due to each justice and judge shall not be diminished during the justices or the judge's appointment. Section 6, Removal. The Tribal Council may remove any justice of the Supreme Court or any judge of inferior tribal courts by a two-thirds vote for a unethical judicial conduct, b physical or mental disability which prevent the performance of judicial duties, c persistent failure to perform judicial duties, d gross misconduct that is clearly prejudicial to the administration of justice. Keep going. Yep. Section 7, vacancies. If there is any vacancy, the Tribal Council shall appoint a Justice of the Supreme Court or a new judge of inferior tribal courts for the unexpired term. If the vacancy involves the Chief Judge of inferior tribal courts, the Tribal Council shall appoint a new, new Chief Judge who satisfies all requirements necessary for a Chief Judge for the unexpired term. Article 6, District. So, so when we talked about vacancies and that those expired terms because some judges were removed mm -hmm. and that's why council had to appoint them for that term, that's where that came in, okay? So it wasn't necessarily a, a violation of the Constitution because that judge position wasn't filled. And as it states in vacancies, council has the right to fill those unexpired terms. So if council is removed out of this process, then who appoints them when there's a vacancy within that term? Say that judge is found guilty of incompetency, for example, and they're removed. Then who will appoint a judge into that position? So walking through this process, remember we said the people would vote on it. It would be at large. We said that um, the people will come up with, the districts will come up with a process, that due process. Now we need to figure out what is the next step if that judge is removed, found guilty, and the council reaffirms that, then who will fill those vacant positions? You have three justices on the Supreme Court. Anytime there's an ethics violation, say with the inferior court or lower court or whatever they call it, then my recommendation is have your um, Supreme Court do the removal because it's based on law, okay. you know, and then both sides are heard. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, the tribal uh, court, don't they have uh, term limits? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I misunderstood. If the vacancy 
or who appoints them? The tribal council appoints any unexpired term. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have the, the, the judges who've, who the people have voted on. Mm -hmm. And so you go down the list and you find out who the next highest vote getter is and so, so on and so forth. And if they're the next highest, highest vote getter is interested, put, put them in and continue down the list. Yeah, they go alternate. Alternate, she said. Article 6, you guys. Article 6, District Organization. Each district established under this constitution shall elect a president and such other officers as may be advisable to run concurrent with the terms of the representatives to the tribal council. The president shall call and preside over councils of the district whenever necessary for the consideration of matters of local interest. The various districts may consult with representatives of the Interior Department on all matters of local interest and make recommendations thereof to the Tribal Council or the Superintendent or Commissioner of Indian Affairs, may undertake and manage local enterprises in furtherance of the purposes set forth in the preamble to this Constitution, may levy assessments upon members of the districts, may expand monies in the district treasury for the benefit of the district, may keep a role of those members of the tribe affiliated with the district, and may exercise such further powers as may be delegated to districts by the tribal council. The actions of the district council shall not be inconsistent with the constitution and bylaws and ordinances of the tribe. This, this is regarding district government. Mm -hmm. Just this year, I think uh, <clears throat> we had, you know, I was a president before in Wakpamani district. And I know my boundaries. I know when not to micromanage. Because I think, you know, a lot of that was through uh, watching of the governments how they operate. But we had a training session one time because of uh, the, uh, the board um, managing district affairs when it, they have a district service officer. So th with that, she, he or she is, has um, management authorities over the staff. So the board is separate from, uh, well, they're together in a sense, but they have no business just like uh, the president can't go in, there, go in there and order staff to do certain tasks. You know, and I've seen that happen over time and again. So I think there should be some wording in there that uh, outlines that fine line. Because I know that uh, the executive, uh, the board, the executive board has authority in uh, managing financial and other responsibilities, but you have a district manager. So uh, I can't go in there as a president and say to the secretary, well, you do one, run these uh, tasks for me. You know, I can't do that with respect for uh, both uh, both sides of the aisle. Uh, back there, Jackie. Oh. Um, 
a few years ago when I was a land and natural resource coordinator for the tribe uh, under uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zephyr, we, uh, we did these reviews of the district uh, centers and we also did program reviews. And anyway, uh, the district and, and neither one were completed. Uh, no fault of the coordinators, but uh, we did we did a lot of work. But um, every district is different, and they have different constitution and bylaws, and it's really a um, so it's really difficult to have something that fits all of them, you know. And, and I think you'd have to look at every one of them, and then after looking at all of them, then maybe change this or improve it, this section. And so uh, one of our tribal attorneys maybe, or one or more of our tribal attorneys maybe should, should do that. You know, take a look at all the district uh, constitution bylaws and uh, kind of see if they fit this section here or see if there's ways to improve it. Uh, because I know they're different. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. Oh, and Gina, can you get that mic and take it Wait, to? No. She's using the little girl's room, so, oh, the library. Thank you. Could we put in there that the tribal or the district presidents and officials could be put on the ballot whenever the, um, the representatives are running and just be voted on that way, the same time as you're running for the tribal council? Because it says you sh that the district presidents follow the same term as the representatives, right? So it would just, I think, be easier maybe. So, yes, that's, you know, ideally what I talked about earlier about having the districts fall in line with the election code and, and have them on the ballot the same time as the tribal election, the general election. However, as I mentioned and as stated, each district is different and some of them have their own election codes. So they vote on their officers at a different time frame. Some may vote on them in April, according to their own election code. So with Article 6, with those revisions that happened in time, really took away um, the district's sovereignty, if you will, and the district's rights. And we're trying to uh, do a one-size-fits-all under Article 6. And so when we look at how their elections are set up, aren't always in tune with how the tribal election is set up. And who, whose right is it to force these districts to change their election codes? Do you want tribal council coming in and telling you how, when you need to vote on your elections? So that's what's stated in Article 6. Do they pay for their own elections? The question was, do you pay for the, the districts pay for their elections? Yes, they do. They pay $6,000 for their elections. <coughs> District government, I was part of that for 10 years in the past. I was a chief judge of district elections for five years of the ten. We, at first, had election every year um, for community and district officials, but the tribe run its election for representatives. And in time, Wakpamani adopted running in concurrent with tribal elections, so given the district elected officials that term. But each 
committee, like housing, enrollment, uh, parks and rec, those programs had a different term of years that a elected official would set. But the overall purpose of district government is the link between the membership of our tribe and tribal programs and its government. It's important to adhere to what district organizations are all about. We looked at this poster one time, it was a poster of a triangle. And the triangle, the tip of it was up on top. Walk by and he turned it around. So the bottom of the triangle is the membership of your district. The bottom is the president of the tribe. They work for us, all of us, members of the tribe. And we're just part of that upside down triangle. So a lot of people, when they get elected, they flip that triangle over thinking they're in power, but they're not. But to improve changes, we looked at running concurrent with tribal elections saved the district thousands of dollars that we can help our membership with. Okay. <clears throat> so Article 7, Elections. Section 1, all members of the tribe 18 years are over who have resided on the reservation for a period of one year immediately prior to any election shall have the right to vote. Section two, the time, place, and manner of nomination and election of councilmen and any other elective officers of the council shall be determined by the tribal council by appropriate ordinances. Section three, the Tribal Council and officers shall be sworn into office the first meeting in December, commencing in. <laughs> Section 3. The Tribal Council and officers shall be sworn into office the first meeting in December, commencing in 1998. The Tribal Council members elected in 1996 shall serve until the first meeting in December 1998. Do we need to add that in there? So section three should be removed? Stricken? Okay. How about section one? Section one limits who votes in our elections. It says all members residing within the reservation boundaries for a period of one year. What about our membership who reside off the reservation? In the beginning of um, this whole process, it says that uh, we can claim anybody that's uh, eligible for membership mm -hmm. and to be a member of this tribe. Then we turn around and say, you can't vote here because you haven't lived here for one year. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end run, too, they probably use those very statistics to get some money, you know, to justify, you know, a program or more money. So, I mean, I think, you know, we really need to revisit that piece right there one year. I think that we give those who reside off the reservation the opportunity to vote because they are enrolled members. We should never how do you say, disclude them or, or not let them vote? Um, I, I, I guess I disagree and um, <laughs> for some very good reasons, I guess. One is the, the cost, you know, there's, there's tribal members living all over all over uh, the United States. And how are you going to let all those people vote? You know? And the other thing is that if they are able to vote in the areas where there's a, a larger population, say like in Rapid City, they're going to want councilmen. Okay? And so 
you need to look at that. You know, you need to look at what is it going to cost. You know, uh, somebody needs to, because uh, it's going to cost. It's going to cost money, and this tribe has limited resources, and we have a limited land base. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. It's kind of off subject here, but you know, land buyback program really didn't inside uh, increase the amount of trust land on this reservation at all. And that was one of the biggest problems with land buyback. It should have, that money should have been able, uh, we should have been able to use that money to purchase fee patent land. But, and we we tried, I mean a lot of, we, were, uh, we had meetings with the tribes in Montana in fact to do that. So we have a limited land base, we have uh, the population uh, increasing on the reservation and do we, do we want to um, add an additional cost uh, to the elections? Um, in any way, I just think that before, um, before anything is, um, is put into uh, uh, up for vote, let's say, before this is put in, up to vote, Somebody needs to look at the cost. You really need to look at the cost and look at um, the long-term cost also because we have a lot of tribal members all over this reservation. The elections that we have on the reservation are costly and they're also difficult. You know, as you know, there's, there's, there's problems with our local elections, you know. And so I just, I think, yeah, it would be good, but uh, I, I see the, the negative side of it as well. Thanks. Well, and I think that, oh, go ahead. And I, I think that we need to look at all the avenues with that. You can do out, mail out ballots. People know we have, how do you say it, word of mouth. We have uh, PSAs, we have the newspapers, we have the radio stations in Rapid City who could let the people know. They don't. We know that they're not going to have a tribal council rep a per representative representing them in Rapid City. It's just to vote down here on the reservation. And so you could look at all these other different ways that that could happen. And it has to be organized. So I, anyway, we kind of have a, but anyway, I just stand strong. Thank you. Oh, I think. <laughs> You guys can debate. <laughs> well, I think I look at it this way. You can't hold it against our tribal members that can't find housing down here, that can't find jobs. So they move off the reservation to make a living. And now, you know, you don't want to reward them with their membership by voting. I mean, technically, if you think about it, where I live, just south of Martin, is not really on the reservation. You know, so it was, you know, trust at one time, but it's just right there. So, I mean, there's already case law already put in effect with a ex-president that ran for office and, uh, you know, another individual that sat on council. So, I mean, you got to think of those things also. Right. One more and then we're going to move yeah. on because we still have eight articles to go and Article 10 is a large article. The membership of our tribe, 18 years and over, were entitled to vote, whether they live on a reservation or off. Um, I think we could just reword re this because people have won elections by one vote. but. Not everyone votes during tribal elections, so I think we can just change section one to read that, that anyone showing a membership oh, yeah. 18 years and older are entitled to vote in district elections, tribal elections, but also the ordinance of tribal elections and district elections kind of define the rules of the election. So this art, article, Seven, section one is just talking about um, the voting rights of membership. OK. 
Okay. Article 8, removal of officers. Section 1, any member or officer of the Tribal Council who is convicted of a felon or any other offenses involving dishonesty honesty shall forfeit his office. Nothing? Update the language, his or her, because it's not just council men on council. Section 2, any officer of the council or any council man shall be subject to recall from office under due process of law for cause. Any complaint against any officer of the council or any council man must be in writing and sworn to by the complainant. No person is to be impeached except by two-thirds vote of the council after the accused had due, process, due notice of the charges against him and an opportunity to be heard in his own defense. That's section two. I forgot, somebody was asking me in here about um, the complaints and where does it give the authority to counsel to deny a complaint once it's brought forth by the people? Do you, Again? Do you know? I'm sorry? Where does it give counsel the authority when a complaint is brought by the people against one of the counsel representatives? to deny that complaint, to vote. So that's a very good question. And this is where our ethics board comes into play. And so this was discussed early on in regards to those complaints. Who hears them, who doesn't? And when that board isn't in place, then it falls back on council, that ethics board. Okay, so that's where it gives it them the right to hear these, either to accept them or not accept them. Okay, now do they give the person um, due notice <laughs> on complaints? Uh, so the process isn't really clearly defined in regards to that, other than what is stated here in the Constitution. Right, Jackie? Yeah, I think. Um, um, the removal process is an ordinance that the council developed, um, and that, that's 4126, I, th I believe it is, and that's the one that has all the, the process of removing a tribal council representative and giving the council the sole authority to, re authority to remove a tribal council. No, that it goes by that ordinance that Jackie was yeah, referencing. Yeah, the ordinance. Yeah, and we do have the ethics in place, but they're not. We're not using it because we don't have a, a ethics committee in place. So that's where that comes in. But still, in the ethics, it, it refers it back to council. If there's a removal recommendation for removal of an officer then it still has to go back through council according to the ordinance. That's up to you to yep. put your suggestions down. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Article 9, referendum. Upon a petition by 
at least one-third of the eligible voters of the Oglala Sioux Tribe are upon the request of the majority of the members of the Tribal Council, any enacted or proposed ordinance or resolution of the Council shall be submitted to popular referendum and the vote of a majority of the qualified voters voting in such a referendum shall be conclusive and binding on tribal council. So, referendum. That's the outline of how a referendum is done. I think they, that we ran into this problem in the past when it says one third of the eligible voters of the Ogallala Sioux tribe is that who voted in the last election. So say there was 3,000 people that voted, you have to have at least one third of those? Is that how it's interpreted? No, of the eligible voters, not in the last election of the list of uh, eligible voters. And so how is that determined? It's determined through our enrollment. So when we look at the enrollment numbers, each district is responsible for updating that information for their community. And at times, it's not always updated. So what is one third? And I'm still trying to get the number of what is one third of eligible voters because if the districts don't update that information at the enrollment office, then we can't get the true number. It doesn't say last election, it just says of eligible voters. Yeah. Article 10, land. Section 1, allotted lands. Allotted lands, including airship lands within the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, shall continue to be held as heretofore by their present owners. It is recognized that under existing law, such lands may be inherited by the heirs of the present owner whether or not they are members of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Likewise, it is recognized that under existing law, the Secretary of the Interior may, at his discretion, remove restrictions upon such land upon application by the Indian owner, whereupon the land will become subject to state taxes and may be mortgaged or sold. And the right of the individual Indian to hold or to part with his land as under existing law shall not be ab ab abrogated by anything contained in this Constitution. But the owner of restricted land may, with the approval of the Secretary of the Interior, voluntarily convey his land to the Oglala Sioux Tribe, either in exchange for a money payment or in exchange for an assignment covering the same land or other land as here and after provided. Is this where our probate code comes in? And, and actually, now because there's the there's uh, the BIA doesn't oversee that probate code anymore. So then now, if you don't have a will, then it goes by the state standards, and that's what was explained to us in regards to that probate. But if we pass our own probate code, we'd go by that, right? Yes, sir. Not the state? Yes, sir. And we don't list anything as having our own OST probate code. Okay. Anything else? Section 2, Tribal Lands. The unallotted lands of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and all lands which may hereafter be acquired by the Oglala Sioux Tribe or by the United States in trust for the Oglala Sioux Tribe shall be held as tribal lands. And no, other and no part of such land shall be mortgaged or sold. Tribal lands shall not be allotted to individuals, individual Indians, but may be assigned to members of the Oglala Sioux Tribe or leased. Other, or otherwise used by the tribe as here and after provided.
Anything there? If uh, now it says the Oglala Sioux tribe cannot sell land, right? But we can assign land. But there's been no land assignment. And if we read further on, it talks about a landless Indian. And we have a lot of landless Indians on our reservation today. So land assignment, when it goes back to Ilka, prior to the land buyback, if we go to the Indian Land Consolidation Act, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was spending hundreds of thousands of, of dollars keeping track of the um, accounts, the IM accounts. And so they wanted to decrease the amount of money that they were spending on keeping track of these fractionated, small fractionated interest, the IM accounts. So then they developed what is known as the Indian Consolidation Act. Under this, they were to purchase up small, very small fractionated land. However, the individuals who had interest in that allotted lands were given the opportunity to buy that land. Okay? And, and I can speak firsthand of this because my husband and I were the first to take advantage of being able to buy up our airship land, that fractionated piece that's been in the family. So under ILCA, that happened. However, the tribe says, well, we can't sell land. Well, it was never their land to sell because it was bought under ILCA. Under the land buyback, they changed that. Where you as an individual landowner that had an interest in that land could not buy that interest from the tribe. So how are we going to be able to help our people gain back their interest or purchase back their interest from the tribe? And this is the section, this is the section where we need to be thinking about that. How are we empowering our own people? Because right now, it's tribal government who owns the majority of the land. We, they gave us our, our money, which was due to us, and we bought back our own land with it. The tribal council itself cannot own land. Well, that's tribal council. <laughs> the government is charged with the responsibility of managing tribal land. There you go. <laughs> Under the, the, this new uh, uh, Cobell buyback program, they put back in that provision where you could buy your family's land before it's offered to the tribe. So and I you shake your hand, but my wife runs the land office and she's doing the buyback program, so I know. <laughs> well, I asked her. Oh, yeah? If you look at the brochure that's handed out, and we have people from the land office, right? And what does the brochure say? Can we buy back that interest from the tribe? Not from the tribe, but from the, see? From the heirs that want to sell them. But see, who's notifying them of that? Nobody. The program is supposed to now. They're supposed to now. Yeah. But in the past, see... That's why it there because it wasn't be allowed before. It, well, exactly. That's my point. <laughs> but it will be now. <laughs> so, but this is the second go around. Majority of the interest have been sold. So, this is this is where we have an opportunity to start to empower our members regarding the land. So. Something to think about. Got one more question. Okay. So we can, can we put that in this section where um, tribal members, our airship members, are allowed to purchase land from the tribe? 
Well, that's my suggestion then. Okay. It's, it's very dangerous. I mean, it would have to be ridden the right way because there's, there's some tribal members that have a lot of assets and uh, they could buy a lot of land and, you know, so that's one of my concerns. Um, this reservation was originally all tribal land. And back in, I did research on it, I did a research uh, paper about the Allotment Act uh, and at OLC. And uh, I think back in eight, 18, up until 18, I think it was 1893, the majority of the tribal members were opposed to the Lotman Act. They wanted land to be all tribally owned, you know. And, and so I think we always, we need to remember that, you know. And I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, we should always use caution. You know, we should be very cautious about um, uh, selling tribal land. I think that's a, you know, <laughs> to, you know, we're, uh, because we don't have that much left, you know, really. If you look at a map of the res a reservation, you know, it's, there's a lot of fee patent land out there. And uh, so I thought I'd share it with you. Thanks. Okay, section three, leasing of tribal lands. Tribal lands may be leased by the tribal council with the approval of the Secretary of the Interior for such periods of time as are permitted by law. <clears throat> In the leasing of tribal lands, preference shall be given first to Indian communities, our cooperative associations, and secondly to individual Indians who are members of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. No lease of tribal land is to a non-member shall be made by the tribal council unless it shall appear that no Indian community or cooperative association or individual member of the tribe is able and willing to use the land and pay and to pay a reasonable fee for such use. Grazing permits covering tribal and may be issued by the tribal council with the approval of the Secretary of the Interior in the same manner and upon the same term of leases. There's one. Pat, Patricia and then. Yeah, I don't think that's really how it's occurring on the leases of the land today. <clears throat> at least not on our land. We have no say in, it, in who's, who's going to lease. And the abuses that are done by the leasee, leaser, we have no control over. When we uh, make a complaint about the leaser with what's going on on our land, uh, our voice is not heard. So I don't think, this is just a wording here that's to appease somebody, not the landowner. Um, I was just uh, going to suggest that maybe in this section or another section that there be uh, something put in there about um, like conservation easements for um, wetlands or conservation easements for uh, uh, other types of land, grassland, etc. Um, because there's there's other types. Uh, they're a little different than a lease, but um, they're important. They're, there's there's funding available for that from. Uh, different uh, federal agencies, including the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and also the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, so anyway, I think there should be something about easements, and it may be a good, uh, there should be a section about, you know, you're talking about the utility easements, something about that too. Um, 
As far as uh, the leasing of tribal lands, <clears throat> um, the tribe has that responsibility, I guess, on tracks that are you know 100 percent or where the tribe owns majority interest. But most of the land is leased uh, uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, because a lot of these areas include allotted land or um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I worked for the BIA uh, for a year in the realty office. I know a little bit about how they do things. And there are problems within the BIA, I'll guarantee you. Uh, and as well as the tribe, we have problems. And, but there's always solutions to problems. And, um, and so we should always, I, I've always tried to be positive. I always try to, even though you know, I've been in this for over 40 years, I try to be positive about uh, the management of, of our land because we have a responsibility to manage, protect, and enhance the land within, this, uh, within the original boundaries of the reservation. Uh, not just the tribal council, all of us, all of us. And, and we need to, uh, to do that for the past generations, the future generations, and present generations as well. And so, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe we, uh, there's, there's other language could even be inserted in here to that effect, you know, to where all of us have this responsibility, not just the tribal council, you know, to, to manage, protect, and enhance the land. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, section four, grant of standard assignments. In any assignment of tribal lands which are now owned by the tribe or which may be hereafter purchased for the tribe by the United States or purchased by the tribe out of tribal funds, preference shall be given first to heads of families which have no allotted lands or interests in allotted lands but shall have already received assignments consisting of less than 20 acres agricultural land or their land of, or their land or interests in land of equal value. No allotted member of the tribe who may hereafter ha have the restrictions upon his hand removed and whose land may thereafter be alienated shall be entitled to receive an assignment of land as a landless Indian. The Tribal Council may, if it sees fit, charge a fee of $10 on approval of an assignment made under this section. Assignments made under this section shall be for the primary purpose of establishing homes for landless Indians and shall be known as standard assignments. When I seen this, the Tribal Council may if she fit, charge a fee that ten dollars how much land are they talking about because some of these um, areas are different types you know they there's um, grazing there's land with water there's <coughs> land with forestry in it and they're bad lands i mean so that fee should it be changed to the value of rather than a dollar amount. Right. So remember when I mentioned earlier that I made a motion to see, sue BIA because they weren't following their processes when it came to the land leases? I asked for the formula. How does BIA determine how, what the value of your lease is, whether it's farm or ranch, uh, uh, farming or grazing? Okay. I wanted to know, how did they come up with this formula? So when I asked this, because the home site's under the tribe, so the home site leases are going through the tribal land office. However, grazing and farming, some of them go through the BIA, some go through the land office, depending on tribe owning the majority of that, that section. So with the BIA, their formula, I asked, was this. They determine, for example, the grazing units based upon the area feedlots, what the cattle are going for, but they don't determine 
or they don't have in that equation if there's a drought, if the prices at our local, which most of our local ranchers go to, they didn't include those feedlots. And not only that, BIA did a survey and they were removing 8,523 acres from the lease units. They were removing these acres. Now, in the past, for example, you had 50 acres and I was leasing your 50 acres and I was paying the rate that they determined that needed to be paid per acre. And with this new survey, they said, oh, but 20 of those 50 are unusable, undesirable, unproductive, okay? In the past, I paid you for the full 50 acres, okay? But now, I'm only gonna pay you for 30 acres. And I've been leasing that piece for 15 years. Now, where's the justification for the landowner? And where's the justification for the leaser? There isn't any. So you have to understand that in this particular, when we look at leasing, we have the grazing ordinance in place, which is off of CRF 25, and how we do the range units. But we don't have a ordinance in place for farmland. There needs to be a whole different process. We have an allocation committee that determines range units. But we don't have one that's specifically structured for the grazing unit, I mean the uh, farming units. So there's, there's a lot of variables included in this and people have to remember that, that with this, we need to put protections in there for our people as well. Um, these sections here, section four, five, six, seven, I think even eight. Um, anyway, they've only been, it's only been, it's my understanding, it's only been used one time for a, a lesser, uh, lesser assignment in uh, Lake Creek District. And I think it involved 320 acres. And so it's never been used on this, this process. And what the tribe has done and the BIA has done here is use leases instead. And so these assignments have never been used, this process. Um, I think Rosebud uses it. There's some tribes that use it. Um, the, the BIA's position here when uh, several years ago, uh, uh, the BI superintendent's position was that it's, it's not a good process, you know, the assignment. But, you know, that's his opinion, you know what I mean? But um, it's, a, it's a unique process, you know, that was put together years, many, many years ago. And, um, but we've never used it. And it's still in the Constitution, though. And so I'll, whether it should be removed, you know, there's some people that may say it should be removed because we don't use it. We use leases instead, you know, residential leases, pasture leases, farm leases, on and on and on. And then uh, if, if the uh, lease, the, the term of the lease would change to, you know, long term, longer than five years, you know, that was one of the, that's one of the justifications to have assignments is to, uh, you know, you can pass it on to your, next generation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's the pros and cons, you know, of this process. And um, anyway, I thought I'd bring that to your attention, everybody here, that uh, the grant of ass assignments has only happened one time here on the Pioneer Reservation, and it's never happened since then. Thanks. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, moving on to section five. Uh, hold on, uh, Steph. Um, how about um, this term subleasing? What? Subleasing. Because um, one time uh, okay. a vehicle hit a cow, 
and then um, just the normal vehicle hitting the cow and taking the report. But on a specific situation, the person, I guess, that was in charge of the cow really wanted a police report and had to get it done right away for insurance purposes. Coming to find out that um, this cow came from Texas and it was on land up here on, uh, on Pine Ridge. And so I started inquiring around and that's where the term came up, subleasing. That goes back to that grazing code. And with the BIA, what they require is a, a rotation plan. So you have enough acres, for example, that you're leasing this pasture, and you have enough, you have to own 50% of your, your cattle. And say you have a big enough to bring in more cattle, the max that you can run is 300 head, okay? So if you brought in additional cattle, you have to prove that you have the acreage to run those additional cattle, okay? And you do a grazing plan where you're supposed to rotate out your pastures. That's what the grazing plan, the BIA requires. And so people were taking advantage of this. And, and I want to say it wasn't our local people. It was non-natives who were bringing in cattle from the outside and subleasing that, you know, in that rotation plan. So they can bring in outside cattle to help make up that difference based upon that rotation plan. So that goes to the BIA. They require that. And that's under that grazing code that I talked about. However, like I said, in the past, people did take advantage of that, and they, they just ran the ground rugged. And with that, they also made it really hard for the Indian rancher to survive. Okay, moving on, next one. We're losing people and we're, we've got to close down by four o'clock because some of you want to stay for bingo. <laughs> Bingo's gonna happen at four, um, so that's why they asked us to finish up by four o'clock. So we need to move forward. I think in regards to land, you see all the subsections. And within the survey, to, to look at that and, and kind of focus, oh. Sorry, 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 sorry. If he had a dollar for every time he has to remind me to do this, he'd be a rich man. <laughs> so in regards to the land, there's all of these sections. And if there's a section that you really want to discuss or get clarification, we can. But I think it's important that we move through the rest of the articles. And in your survey, you have the opportunity to look at these sections within Article 10 and make your recommendation as far as the changes are concerned, okay? So let's move on. Is there any, any subsection that we need to discuss or need clarification on under Article 10? None? Okay. So we can move on to Article 11? Yes? Okay. So Article 11, Amendments. The Constitution and bylaws may be amended by a majority of the qualified voters of the tribe voting at an election called for the purpose by the Secretary of the Interior, provided that at least 30% of those entitled to vote shall vote in such election. But no amendment shall become effective until it shall have been approved by the Secretary of the Interior. It shall be the duty of the Secretary of the Interior to call an election on any proposed amendment at the request of two-thirds of the Council, or upon presentation of a petition signed by one-third of the qualified voters, members of the tribe. Any discussion around that? Pete. Okay, wait now. Bob 
Oh, excuse me. Is there a timeline on all we're working on today? Is, is there a timeline on it? So there'll probably be an election within this election year, right? Or, Correct. Okay, thank you. So the timeline is, is we're hoping to have the secretary of election in June. June. Why? Because when we talk about those assurances of implementation, well, transition. So for when I say transition, what does that mean? Well, if we are to change Article 3 and put qualifications and put term limits and extend term limits and stagger terms, what is that going to look like? Okay? So we have to be able to implement that in this next election, right? So with that, we as a task force are going to develop a, a transition plan and an implementation plan. And that means to say, what is this going to look like six months down the road? Because there's no guarantee that any one of us on the task force will be voted back in to council. Right? So who's going to enforce it? So these plans are what's going to help enforce it. Now, if you look at this, and one of the concerns was, what if council shoots it down? Then what? Well, it doesn't say that it's the sole decision of council, does it? What does it say? Members, members of the tribe. It says 30%. So if we do a petition, it doesn't even have to go to council. It goes straight to the Secretary of Interior of eligible voters. So that petition can go straight to the Secretary of Interior with all of the amendments. That's an option. That's part of our Constitution. And in the future, we can even remo remove the Secretary of Interior. Nowhere does it stay in that code that we have to send it to the Secretary of Interior. Any suggestions? <clears throat> why, why do we have to abide by or going through the channels of the Secretary of Interior? Why, if we're a sovereign nation, why do we have to do that? Because it exists within our current constitution, and we accepted this and we passed it as a people. So if we remove it in the future, we don't have to go through the Secretary of Interior. But as long as it remains, we have to follow that process. Why should that be another thing that we need to do in this revision? You have to make mm -hmm. comment. Yeah, I guess that's what I would do is I would um, put in that referendum to exclude the interior, a Department of Interior. You know, this Constitution is um, almost obsolete. <laughs> you know, it's too old. <laughs> And we need something that is workable, that is understandable, and that, uh, you know, it's, it involves every membership uh, pertaining to our lands and, and us as sovereign. We need to take that power back, you know, and that we don't have to be uh, regulated so much. So Article 12, Bill of Rights. The Tribal Council, in exercising its inherent powers of self-governance, shall not make any tribal law or enforce any tribal, state, or federal law that A, prohibits the full exercise of Lakota culture and spirituality or any other religion or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press 
are the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition for a redress of grievances. B. Violates the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, or effects against unreasonable search and seizures, nor issue warrants but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or thing to be seized. Mm -hmm. C. Subjects any person for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy. D. Compels any person in any criminal case to be witness against himself or herself. E. Takes any private property for public use without just compensation. F. Denies to any person in a criminal proceeding the right to a speedy and public trial to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against the person, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in the person's favor and at the person's own expense, to have the assistance of counsel for the person's defense. G, requires excessive bail, impose excessive fines, inflict cruel and unusual punishments. H, denies to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws or deprive any person of liberty or property without due process of law. I, adopts any bill of attainer or ex, ex post facto law. R. J. Denies to any person accused of an offense punishable by imprisonment the right upon request to a trial by jury of not less than six persons. Comments? No comments? Article 12. Okay. So, some of the other discussions was is under the Bill of Rights, our people want it to be able to bear arms, and that is to be able to have weapons and to have them licensed and registered with the tribe. So that was another addition that was added on there. And with representation and no undue fines and so forth, today our courts try charge our people and it says the right to representation but we say a right to hire <laughs> legal representation so that's not given to us with that being said what I'm trying to tell you is when you go to court and you're innocent for example of what you're charged with you go to court you're fined innocent in this charge you still pay court costs So, it's something to think about as we look at this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Another thing is when you ask, you ask for a jury trial, they used to have what they call pretrial. They kind of went away from the pretrial where you can negotiate that, that plea, and they went right into. You asked for a trial, and what they did was, okay, we'll give you a trial, but it's going to be a bench trial. Now, that's not up to the court because it's in your Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. So they need to really be challenged on this or adhere to it because that's just wrong. Everybody's entitled to that, and that language where you, the same as the Constitution or, of the United States is that you have a right to an attorney if you can't afford one, and that language should be in there. Right, but right now, according to our code, you are going to be charged for an attorney. It's up to you to find your own, you know, attorney. Right. Correct. But it's not listed in here, so that's your recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Um I used to go to the jails and uh, uh, we'd hear these inmates tell about their excessive fines, you know, and I, I'm not the one that's seen what the charges are or anything in depth like that, but 
they imposed a lot of uh, uh, excessive veil from um, eastern part of the reservation, the Kyle, the Kyle Court. And I don't know how that was remedied, but I hear even in our court here in uh, Pine Ridge how there, some of those individuals didn't go to uh, court for over 48 hours. You know, so that's denying them their individual rights. Mm -hmm. So I think there should be some amendments in there that protects that person, their legal. And, and another thing is those advocates. They charge a, a whole lot of money just to talk to somebody. And you know, just by looking around and you know, we're the poorest county in the nation. Mm -hmm. And then to have our people abusing our own people in the legal sense, that's not right. So I think with a solution to that would be some wording in there to amend uh, the history of those abuses, you know. Okay, moving on. Article 13, <clears throat> Responsibilities of Executive Committee Officers, Section 1. It shall be the duty of the President to preside over all meetings of the Tribal Council and to carry out all orders of the Tribal Council, unless prevented by just causes. The President, with the assistance of subordinate Executive Committee Officers, shall also exercise powers delegated to the President by the Tribal Council. Section 2, the Vice President shall perform the duties and execute the powers of the President in the absence of the President and shall assume the Presidency in the event of a vacancy in the office. Section 3, the Secretary shall keep an official record of each regular and special meeting of the Tribal Council, meetings of subcommittees of the Tribal Council, and meetings of the executive committee and shall perform such other duties delegated to the secretary by the tribal council. The secretary shall make available to the public all laws, rules, regulations, and meeting minutes adopted by the tribal council and the executive committee. Section four, the treasurer shall be the custodian of all funds which come under the jurisdiction or control of the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council. The treasurer shall pay out funds in accordance with the laws established by the tribal council, shall keep accounts of all receipts and disbursements, and shall make written reports <coughs> to the tribal council at each regular and special meeting. The treasurer shall be bonded in such an amount as the tribal council by law shall provide. The books of the treasurer shall be subject to inspection or audit by the direction of the tribal council. Section five, the fifth member shall inform the executive committee of the actions taken by the tribal council and shall report back to the tribal council the actions or implementations taken by the executive committee. The tribal council may also assign other duties to the fifth member. Section six, there shall be an executive committee which shall consist of the president, the vice president, the secretary, the treasurer, and the fifth member. The executive committee shall act on behalf of the tribal council when the tribal council is not in session and shall be in charge of all routine matters that arise during such recess, including the administration of the land provisions of this constitution and such other matters as may be delegated to it by the tribal council and shall make a report at each regular and special session of the, of the Tribal Council and shall adopt resolutions that are not inconsistent with the resolutions or ordinances adopted by the Tribal Council. <coughs> so, okay. So, your recommendation is to... That's a lot of money being paid out in salaries to your executive board, which could be well spent other places. 
um, looking at it as a point of view when if some say our tribe is a corporation, you know, it's a business. There's millions and millions of dollars that come to this tribe. So common sense is say, let's have a business council that have those degrees in business and you're going to see things start to improve. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. You know, as, as people watch in the council when you're uh, meeting and in sessions, and then outside of that, um, I don't want to um, say, but there's um, miss malfeasance, I should say, malfeasance with the monies and money is taken away from programs that were channeled elsewhere. You know, who, how do we correct this? I mean, how do we put in checks and balances on the treasure on each of these positions? That would be my recommendation that we uh, look into this more in depth and then put in our uh, recommendations at a later time when you have the opinions of everyone. <clears throat> okay. Article 13, or oh, sorry, I read that already. Article 14, Qualifications of Tribal Council Representatives and Executive Committee. Um, officers. Any person elected as a Tribal Council Representative or as a Executive Committee Officer must be a member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, be at least 30 years of age at the time of election, and must reside within the exterior boundaries of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation as defined in Article 1. Gilbert. I think uh, two parts should be added. One is experience. Person should have some experience in working in some form of tribal government, whether it's at the district level or um, even like OLC Board of Directors um, or something like that. They should have some sort of experience to show that they are a leader. The other thing is that they should have um, educational qualifications, at least a minimum. Okay, Article 14, <clears throat> Oath of Office. Section 1, each tribal council representative and executive committee officer shall be required to take an oath of office prior to assuming constitutional duties. Oath, I blank do solemnly swear that I will promote, preserve, and strengthen the general health and welfare of the Oglala Lakota Oyate and I will support and defend this constitution and the human rights of the Oglala Lakota Oyate and the human rights of other peoples as recognized as in international laws treaties, <clears throat> which includes both the 1851 and 1868 Fort Laramie treaties and declarations. Article um, 16. 16. and under the oath of office where they're uh, going to defend this constitution and the human rights of the Oglala Lakota Oyate and the civil rights, civil rights of the Oyate as well. Human and civil rights. Connie, did you get that? Protect the Indian civil rights, Indian civil rights, she said.
Oh. Next one. Next one. Okay. Article 16. <clears throat> Meetings and procedures. Section 1. The Oglala Sioux Tribal Council shall conduct a mandatory regular meeting on the last Tuesday of each month. But if the last Tuesday of each month falls on any holiday officially observed by the Oglala Sioux Tribe, the regular meeting shall occur on the next business day. Section 2. Two-thirds of the duly elected members must be present to constitute a quorum. Section 3. When a majority of tribal council members sign a written statement requesting a special meeting, the president shall call a special meeting no sooner than two days. Section 4. The tribal council may adopt an ordinance establishing the process for the president to call emergency meetings to deal with natural, biological, or chemical disasters. Section 5. The Tribal Council shall adopt an ordinance establishing the order of business in any regular or special meeting. Article 17. Yeah. National. Oh. Meetings, no discussion on Article 16. No discussion on Article 16, meetings and procedures. Why is there so many additions to the agenda? That's my question. Seems like there's a time frame of uh, 14, seven, seven to 14 days for these to get on the agenda, and yet when we have a council meeting, we sit there and listen to uh, almost a whole day of getting things two thirds on the agenda. I think. Uh, that should be part of this section. Right. Put it in that ordinance that there is for this, this piece. Good thing. OK, that's a recommendation. Also, there was discussion from people saying, why aren't you having your council meetings in the districts? Why are you just having them at the chambers? And we started out having them in the districts, and then it got, due to cost, then it got subject to just Pine Ridge. And now, for some reason, we're moving out again to the dis to Pine uh, Martin. Not necessarily our district, but it's going to be hosted in Martin. There's something that we did. Um, we wanted at our district meetings every program director to make it on their calendar to visit the district announcing their staff and what they do and what they offer. There's um, one time there's a question asked to a meeting in Rapid City. How many of you can name all the tribal programs? And before that she said how many of you know how many tribal programs there is? At that time, that year, it was 59 tribal programs, not knowing what they were, who's running them, and what they do. And of the 59 tribal programs, some are seasonal. They're only there during the school, school years. But the oath of office should be taken by um, a lot of these directors themselves when their staff and their attitude toward the general public is really bad. Same as the board, board members that govern some of those schools and those program committee members, um, boards. I, public safety, a classic example of a board that went wrong. You know, so the Procedures, meeting and procedures, somehow we should tie into all tribal programs, must visit all districts, nine meetings, nine days out of 365, take time to go meet with district governments. We're almost done. Yeah, I really agree with, with what he says. However, a lot of times that a lot of programs are 
held down or, or stopped or prevented from going out to the districts. For one thing, we, we, our mileage is not approved and just all kinds of things like that. I don't want to say too much because I know we're on the air or whatever. So anyway, that's, those are some of the things that, that are happening. But we're still going out. Good. <clears throat> okay, Art, um, Article 17, National Sioux Council. The Tribal Council may appoint delegates to represent the Ogallala Sioux Tribe in National Sioux Councils. That last one. Did you change that? Yeah. Comments? That's okay. I really want to thank all of you. I want to thank the people who have stayed all the way through, and you, you two, and all of uh, Stephanie, everyone who was involved in this, because I've seen a lot of the meetings that have been taking place. I want to thank KOLC, because I do watch it. I watch whatever, even the basketball games. But I just really want to say thank you so much for everything that you do. I really appreciate that, and I hope everything goes well. Wopila. Thank you. Thank you. We did. Where does it say in here about the representative? Or did I miss it? We went over it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's under Article 3. So when you do your survey, look at Article 3. So if you got your surveys, you can leave them in the box or get them to us as soon as you can. And we also have it on the Ovalo website, and that's, oh, sorry. You can also get this survey on our website, and that's oglalalakotanation.info. That's the website. We also have a Facebook page, so it's Facebook forward slash... O S T C O N S T R E F O R M. And you can get the survey on there. You can get the Constitution. You can get the treaties. But we strongly encourage you to fill out your surveys because this is where we start to frame that data, which you give to us to make these revisions. So you can leave them here with us. Okay. Or, con or you can contact us mm -hmm. or leave them at the secretary's office or your service centers. Okay. Whatever makes you comfortable. But we really, we extended the deadline just for this week to include you, so we need to have them by Friday. No later than Friday okay, for I your service. I'm going to ask that. This Friday then? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I too want to thank you ladies for taking your time and and your extreme patience with us as we, uh, I know that sometimes we strayed away from what the intent of this presentation was, but also that you hear our, our, our frustrations and uh, as the people. And, there, and so I think the questions that you hear from us, even though it isn't directly related to the uh, revision itself, you, that I think uh, you should un you would you un do understand that there is a need for this, you know. So I, I want to thank you for taking up the cause of something that has been a long time coming. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yes. So tell your programs, tell your families, tell your communities. We really need to get involved, and we really need to fill out that survey so we can make these huh? revisions. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. They want to do a closing prayer. Yeah. They want to do okay. a closing prayer. Closing prayer. Pat. I just want to thank you for uh, your presentation, and uh, I hope 
this goes well. It's about time because we need, we the people need to have this voice for our government because obviously it's not working. Closing prayer. Yeah. Closing prayer. Oh. Hoblazana Taku was testy Unki Unki Chinchapi Picte Nahana Tiatana Tona Wania Wakai Yuhana Cup He Leha Hopila Unkenichapi Oyateki Mitakoyasi Me or message.